firefighters to, you know, do the right thing, which is why I joined up in fire was because I really wanted to protect resources. So now I'm a firefighter, and um, I know a lot about fire behavior. Uh, hopefully I can convey some to you. My idea here is that partly you'll get big fires, but mostly I want you to stand out in your own communities and go, ah, oh, I know exactly what I want to do, because the last question was very real. What plants should come and what should go and what should I do next? So maybe if I talk about the characteristics of fire, our fire danger, firefighting a little bit, and how you can change fire behavior at your house. So fire ecology is what Robert talked about, and I'm going to talk about fire science, which is really, honestly, a study of physics and fire behavior. It has all kinds of math and things in it, uh, although I won't spend any time on many graphs or things like that. So. But if I do have them, I probably didn't make them. I stole them from Marty and Robert. But in general, you saw a bunch of stuff about vegetation, and this one, if you look at the red and the orange, you'll find that the flame lengths themselves are really tall. The, this area up here where I have the different colors tries to give you the idea of, so all that is really saying, once again, is that, whoa, we get really big fire here. Lots of plants out here shoot out a lot of really tall flames, and really tall flames mean that you're not gonna stand next to it, and neither is a firefighter. We have human-caused fires. They're very high intensity, which means how hot they are, BTUs. They're wind-driven. They have a very rapid rate of spread, which means they move really fast along the landscape. They stand-replace, which means you know the stand of vegetation that was there is gone, so that all new stuff is gonna grow back. And they are crown fires. Normally, you think of timber on fire and the tops of the trees on fire. Well, we have little baby timber. It's not, you know, sometimes it's four feet, but sometimes it's as much as 18 feet tall. So that's our trees, and the fire will rush through there and burn all of it, right? Right, like as if it was a crown fire. And it mostly occurs in the fall season. And then I'm sure the captain in the back will concur with me. We actually have wildland fires here almost every day, shy of when it's raining, shy of the... Of the um, time period that you saw in the graphs, it's just that we put them out. And so, and we just go there and we put them out and they're not very big and it has a lot to do with the conditions of the moment. So our goal is to put out 95%, to put out all fires, to suppress them. This is the regime where we don't want to have extra fire on the landscape to change it, so we put them all out. And so in putting out 95% of all fires, I mean, we're working up there, we're coming and we're putting them out and we're really successful at what we do. There are some fires that come on the day, the moment, the place, that nobody's putting them out. Nobody's gonna get there in time, and the wind's gonna blow them, and they're in the perfect spot. So that's the kind of big fires that we get. We don't get them that often. You know, it used to be 70 years apart, you know, and more people came, and it was 50, and then more people came, and it was 30, and we came, it's 20. So we keep getting fires closer and closer together. Face it, we got lots of people and lots of ways to start fires, right? We weed whack, we drive, we have kids that play with matches, we, um, you know, arson seems to be a piece of it, and they get really big fires during arson fires because they come during the San Anas, right? And we get a lot of really big fires because of our power lines, but they come because of winds. So when we try to think prior prevention, we really kind of need to recognize all of it. There's tons of things that you and I can do that are very, very simple to prevent fires. Wildland fire is based on weather, topography, and fuels. So. There's the art of structure fire, and people learn a lot about what burns and why and how long and how fast and how hot. This is a structure fire without a box around it, and it all depends on fuels and topography and weather. So we have a lot of topography here, and we have a lot of weather here, and we have a lot of interesting fuels. So I'm going to talk on each one and still try to stay within a reasonable amount of time. This is called our fire behavior triangle, and we have different components of each. And if I was teaching a week-long class to firefighters, I would go in-depth to each one of these. And I'm just going to cruise through them to give you enough information to think. So think landscape a little bit, but also think your house, your community. What kind of vegetation do I have, and how does this apply? So topography first is pretty straightforward. Um, the steeper the hill, the bigger the fire. All right, And it's easy to understand because on flat ground, well, Imagine a campfire, and you guys are scooching your chairs up next to it, or you're getting close and you're turning your back over and over to it. But you wouldn't want to stick your hand over the top of it. It's great, the radiant heat is great, but the convective heat coming off the top, super hot. 80% of the energy is coming off the top. All right, so if you put it something on a slope, you actually bring all the vegetation closer to that part of the fire, 
right? So it's preheating and driving off the moisture, spotting out in front, and accelerating its speed. So we have this th saying in fire that it goes up 16 times faster than flat ground. So nobody's running that fast, and least of all uphill. So anyway, that's one really th important thing to think of. Now, those of you that already own your home, don't think of that too much because there's not any place real flat in the Santa Monica Mountains. All right, so this is a good faster ignition and faster spread on all slopes, not to mention the fact that material is rolling downhill and spotting into places where it's not on fire yet. Another thing is canyons. Canyons are narrow, and the heat, of course, is actually that same ability to bring the flames closer to this vegetation is also happening on this side. All right, so now the whole place is drying and heating. And so you can see fire on this side of the hill and not really recognize that it got all the way to the bottom and all the way back up. It can just light the side. Because fire is driving the moisture out of a plant or anything and then replacing it by, and lighting it on fire, bringing it up to ignition temperature. So it's got a lot to do about with moisture. Another problem is chimneys and box canyons. In other words, where we have something narrow that goes straight up like this, and what it's just like this. You have this sort of extra quick airflow, and you have this superheated air that's going through here and heating this up. So the fire that's just sort of getting started, next thing you know, all the way to the top. Not a good place to be. So that's topography. So there's a bunch of places in the landscape that are not safe for firefighters, not a good place to put line, and not a good place to put houses, for that matter. So I want to switch over to the characteristics of our vegetation, which we firefighters always call fuel. So I will dance between those two words and probably call it fuel the most. So these things have, have these kinds of characteristics. They're either compact or they're loose. They're full of fuel moisture. They're tall. They're short. They lay down on the ground real compact. They stand up in the air and they're very aerial. And you, if you and I had a BIC, we could just experiment like crazy and just show each other. <laughs> just keep wishing for that moment. Or I could just say, see, look at this one light, you know. It's like the white sage that everyone uses for their ceremonies. Like, you know, how, have you lit in, you know, have you, you dry this and you light it and you know how it stays on fire? Okay, so it's got a chemical component to it. It's the perfect size, the perfect shape. It's got lots of surface area. Has a love, so, and it smells like wildfire. Mm -hmm. So anyway, <laughs> stuff like that is out there that's you know good burning, bad burning type stuff. So I'll try to go through each of these concepts without getting too, too crazy. It's either loose or it's compact. And so I have this. A couple of boxes here. I, I actually usually get that Vanna White job, I don't know why. So, loosely compacted, lots of sycamore leaves are a good example, right? But any kind of deciduous tree that you've got going in the backyard, this is loosely compacted. Want to put that in the light? Yeah. Stick that in the light there. So. And so here's mostly your oak leaves and some pine needles, all right? And so normally they're kind of smooshed up against the ground. There's not a lot of oxygen in there and they're very tightly packed. So not especially conducive to moving fire very quickly. It moves very slowly there, moves very quickly here. Do not let this be against your house or under your porch or anything like this. This is the bad stuff, right? So this is the stuff you're gonna sweep and move away. Thanks. So, Another thing about fire in the fire and out in the vegetation is that it's, it's got different weight. There's a different amount of stuff, all right? So out in the grasses, it might be a whole ton in an acre. But meanwhile, over in another place where there's a bunch of trees, it's many, 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 many tons per acre. So the more stuff, the hotter the fire, right? The more stuff that's on fire, got to back off the bonfire there. So that's another thing that we think about when we're out there is how much fuel is there? Robert made a really good point about light fuels. They're light, they light easy, they're good places for fires to start. They carry the fire, they will move fire from place to place. There also changes re really rapidly, changes. The weather can change it and the wind can change it and that's one of the reasons that people get caught in uh, light fuels is because it just changes and you don't have time to get out of the way. Another really important factor with fire moving from place to place is it likes to go from one piece of fuel to the next. So 
they literally, you know, everybody's heating everybody else, right? So if they're sitting beside each other, they're continuous, right? And they're gonna light. Now, if you separate them, this might get so hot that maybe some of this stuff will light. You know, it kind of depends on what kind of plants they are. So that's what you end up with is patchy fuels are less likely to be on fire than continuous fuels. So this is why we asked you to space and thin things at your house. So here's an example of patchy fuels um, spaced out. This is, this is an aerial view. And of course, if we got down there, you'd see that there's a continuous light vegetation on the ground, but that's been so grazed and so beat up, it's not, not gonna carry fire. Here's another example of why something would be patchy with a big barrier like this, with rocks and things along those lines, which you can use rocks at your house to make barriers and sidewalks. There is actually a fire here. Mm -hmm. This is fire what I was on in Oklahoma. Another thing about fuels is that they are arranged. They're either kind of stand-up-y stuff or they're that compact-y stuff. They lay on top of each other. And so, once again, just think air can circulate in there, you know, they're apart. It's just easier to light. So vertical fuels are far more flammable and far more of a problem than your compact fuels, the ones that are actually horizontally. So see where the depth changes? how the dotted line goes across, everything's below the dotted line, and over here things are above the dotted line. It's just trying to show you how tall stuff is. So that's another thing about fuels is when they're vertically arranged like our shrubs, they burn really well. But if you get underneath a canopy of a tree and everything's all kind of laying down on the ground, it doesn't burn very fast. It may be, it'll, be, it'll light, there's no doubt about that, but it won't move very fast. It'd be pretty hot in this one because that vegetation's actually got lots of stuff. When we, f when we finally get this guy on fire, we got plenty of fire and it's gonna last a long time. But you're not gonna be able to light this with a match, right? And not even a bick, right? It's just not gonna work. That's your house. It doesn't light easily. So another thing about vertical arrangement, and we talk about this at your house too, is that we want the fire to stay low and down on the ground in those compact fuels if it's there at all, right? So we do not want it to climb from here up here. And so we call this ladder fuels. This is a nice little vertical ladder that'll take things from the ground up into the canopies of the trees. In this case, it's trees, but it still works with shrubs too, with smaller bushes. You just have to change your scale. So you keep your grass really low and green, and then your little plant has a nice stem and some space, you know, and you don't let ladder fuels take fire into your different plants. Chemical content. One of the reasons I did this one is because it's cool. This isn't here, this is actually in Florida, and this needle grass and this palm just lights like crazy. Now, this, it's actually already burned on this side and it's backing towards you. The wind is pushing it away from us. So it's really fighting its way this direction. So that's an example of grass on fire and tall grass on fire that actually has a chemical component to it so that you can tell that it's, um, you get bigger flame lengths, you know, the chemical components, some of them have, like pitch in pine, for instance, that makes it more volatile, all right? Um, chemise happens to have a lot of resin in it. It burns really well, it gets really dark. Um, what's another good one that we have? Well, our sages, our sages burn better here, stuff like that. So Mac doesn't have a ton of resin. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Eucalyptus, thank you. Eucalyptus, pine, that's exactly, I was, that was my other one. Thank you for bringing that up. This, see, that this is, I love this one because notice that looks like our palms and looks like ours, but this one is dead green, and this is Florida. It's green, 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 green. It looks like, no way, you're not gonna light it. You just go, and it's just fires like crazy. But they, their ecosystem is different. They want this stuff to burn because they have those, if you remember in the video, they have those nice trees, and they get a lot of, lot of um, lightning right, in Florida. There's lots and lots of storms, so often that stuff burns. And it wouldn't burn that green and that kind of, you know what I mean, it's really humid there, right? So you've got this not dry climate, how does this stuff burn? Chemical content. Meanwhile, another really important part about fuels is that um, how moist they are, because again, they're like, that water is like little fire engines inside them. So the flames are all trying to drive away all the moisture so they can finally get it to ignition temperature and get it to, get it to light. So we have moist vegetation and live vegetation. Both living fuels are moist and dead fuels can actually be moist, right? I mean, we can put water on them, 
all right? So they do. So we kind of, in fire, we just had this whole math thing that we like to do about different kinds of fuels. S things like this. The difference between this diameter and this diameter, as you can see from the various pictures up here, has a big difference. This one will change with humidity. It'll change with moisture overnight recovery. This one will dry up an hour later. This one, more time, like 10 hours before this one's gonna change. It's gonna stay the same. So it'll probably light all day or not light all day. Those are the kinds of things that actually tell us what our, where our fire danger is. Where are we in the scheme of things like that? So when you think about your yards, which one do you want? <laughs> all right, so we've got little teeny thin ones and then they get a little bigger and then they're sticks and then after that, we tend to think it takes almost a thousand hours for these, you know, something like this takes around a hundred to a thousand hours to actually change. And it's hours, I'm not talking days. And then you can have the 10,000 hour fuels that only change by, by drought. These kind of change by season. So this guy's going to be different in one season than, a ne than the next. But if I had a big piece of fuel, it would probably only be different from drought to not drought, something like that. These conditions are measured all the time. This is where our fire danger and information that comes from your forestry department. Here's just a good example of a slide that shows us how vegetation that's dead can actually still change its moisture content. So we got relative humidity, a little bit of dew, and then from the ground, there's moisture on the ground. So stuff that's laying tight against a moist ground is definitely going to be moist, and therefore the travel, the fire through that is gonna be impeded. So hence, when you're mulching or you're choosing what to do with your vegetation, you know, moist is better, green is good, dead is bad. What's this one? It's missing its middle part. This is a very easy graph to understand. <laughs> oh, there it is. There's the daily relative humidity, kind of the thing that it does. I forgot. I don't know. I must have done that. All right, and then here's the moisture content. And you can see the slight change that goes with vegetation that just goes with relative humidity because you know it starts off in the morning. Let's just say we had, if we have to clean our windows and we had moisture on our cars, we had overnight recovery 100% moisture. And then as the day changes, right, it changes to where it's dry. Our, we, we're radical here, you know, we just really fluctuate on daily. We even get days where we don't get overnight recovery at night. Right? And it goes on and on and on. And that has a huge impact on our vegetation. Because all that stuff that's trying to sit on the ground or hanging out out there, finally it's just like, I'm sorry, but I am dry. <laughs> like, no amount of moisture is going to fix this. All right? So duration of precipitation also. So, we don't, so when you get the downpours and it just rains in one day, everything kind of goes, whoa, I'm wet. But you know, it really didn't sink in. So that's what this kind of shows you, is that your different fuels, your one hour fuels, how quickly they react. So this is how many hours of precipitation. The li light stuff, this thin stuff, you know, pretty quick on how quickly it changes and where it stays, you know, meaning no matter. Whereas that bigger piece of fuel I was holding, you know, it just wasn't changing, not changing that much. So we like long sprinkles that last for a week. That's what we like. That changes everything. But when we get a downpour and then it's windy the next day, mm. Mm. so the LA County Forestry does this wonderful job of taking care of our live fuel moistures. And I just wanted to show you, Robert did this already, but I have a different point. So you have your averages, the black line that's you know 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. And then you have different years here. And what we like to see is to stay at average. That would be nice. You know what I mean? Maybe bump over it once in a while. I mean, I used to say, hey, fire season, let's all go to fires, but now I don't say that anymore. <laughs> I've been to many hundreds of fires. It's okay, I've got it. I've pretty got it on the fire thing. So check out this. This is 2007, Corral Fire, Canyon Fire, San Diego's fires. Look how far below average we are. <laughs> I'm up. sorry, it's all over, time's up. And then check, but here, here's 2009 and 10, and see how close we are to to the averages, see how it's more. So I think I put, here's this year, to date. Thanks, L Thanks LA County Forestry, thank you Jay Lopez for providing these, these visuals for us. This is the bad news. So we wish we were here. This is where we were last year. This is where we are. It's low. It kind of looks a little bit like some of these, huh? But unfortunately, I'm saying it, it looks a little bit like this. But you know what's really weird is that climate change thing is when do you get it? thunderstorm dumping rain like that in April. Yeah. 
here. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, I lived here a while. That's news, that's news. But one thing about here is it's always different. So you kind of ask, did I really, did I experience that when I was 10? I can't quite remember. So, was I even thinking like that when I was 10? Probably not. Because of course I'm not very old, so I had to reach to 10, you know what I mean? I didn't say 20. All right, so, uh, liar. Oh, so, live to dead, it's real. <laughs> It's important too out there, we've talked about this. This is a good example of your buckwheat in bloom. Lots of live fuel moisture, it's a happy plant, and it would take us a long time to stick a lot of kindling under that to get that bush to go. I can go out there with a drip torch and I can dump drip torch mix all over it, I can put a bit to it and all the drip torch mix will burn. But the plant will probably just look at me like, really, that was so rude. <laughs> but here's buckwheat later on, right? And it's dry, it's got those little buttons, and those little buttons like to be on fire, and they like to shoot around, so they make great little, little ways to make fire keep moving. This is an example, these are green, this is all not green, so therefore fire is gonna work really well right here. And the nice thing is, is here's this nice little campfire that's gonna drive the heat right out of this plant, right? So it, this is gonna be enough fuel to, to light that one on fire. Because in general, there's times when I've burned in other areas where you kind of burn the dead, but the green stuff will, won't light. And you're like, oh, great, great. Or it kind of works like snow if snow was sitting there instead. I'm not going to talk about this one very much because it's, that's a Robert graph right there. But I'll just go over to changing how we think about grouping them up. So f things carry fire, right? So in our different kinds of vegetation that we have, we grouped them into four groups, and we changed it to like, it used to be 13 models, and now it's like 40. So, but we're just gonna stick with these four. This is the primary carrier of the fire. If you've got grass, grass carries it. If you've got brush, brush carries it. If you have timber that's lopped up and no ladder fuels, then the only thing that's gonna carry fire is what's on the ground, and that's just gonna be a bunch of leaves. And if you have slash, slash is like when somebody went through and did a timber harvest and all the tr leftover trees are still on the ground. So that's really logs and big stuff that's laying on the ground. That's what carries the fire. So there's good pictures, grass right here. That fire, that's gonna carry the fire. That's gonna be a grass fire. It's gonna move fast, quick. It's gonna change easily. It's gonna go for a long time. Put any wind on it, whoo, it's gone. Shrubs, you know how they bur burn here. Here's the litter, the idea that what's this is one of those ones that you want to stay on the ground. And then here's an example of something that you, it's not going to move very fast, but it's going to be really hot and it's going to be impossible to put out. It's going to take a lot of water and a long time. Robert showed you the map. This is the vegetation, right? So that same vegetation, you change it to fuel models. Robert made this map too. So that this is those models. That, remember I told you there are 40 of them. Since those four groups get changed to these 40 models. And so that's the kind of stuff that we have. And as, as you know, we mostly have chaparral, coastal sage, some oak woodlands. Here's a good example of grass. This is near Potrero. So you can imagine this fire is going to carry very quickly through all of this, everywhere there's grass. If this vegetation is moist, then it'll probably stop when it gets there. Or it'll slow down enough that, you know, out come the trucks and out comes the water and out comes the helicopters. And, you know, it'll rush up the hill. Remember, I told you, it's gonna go uphill. It's gonna have the bigger flame lengths. It's gonna lean against everything. So it loves to go uphill. Those of you that are sitting perched on a hill with vegetation under you, you got a problem that you have to deal with. And you need to think of that while you're doing your defensible space. You need to change the dynamics of the fire behavior that are under you. You don't have to denude the slope because the slope will fall down and then your house won't be there anymore. So we don't want to do that. So here is an example of grass on fire. This is out at Hunter League where we do some fire operations. And we just basically are doing prescribed burning and teaching our new guys how to put water on stuff. So you can see how tall it is. It's got a slight wind on it. The vegetation itself is probably, you know, just above, it's below your knee. And that's how tall the flame length is. It's probably about three and four feet. It's got a couple of mile hour wind on it, and it consumes everything. You can only stand so close. Remember next to, um, next to that camp of fire of yours, you can only stand, stand so close to that. Shrubs, on the other hand, right? That's continuous shrubs, and that's vegetation. Now that fire is not moving as fast. It doesn't have as much wind on it. This is driven by the fact that there's slope, available vegetation, fire. All right, here's Robert's example. He was trying to show you, think how tall this is, think how tall these are. The taller they are, the hotter it is. 
It's just something that we utilize when we're thinking about fire and how it behaves. The taller it is, the hotter it is, the hotter it is, the faster it moves, the taller it is, the hotter it is, the faster it moves. It's just a vicious cycle. And just keeps going like that until something stops it. So something changes it. Is it going to be the weather, a road, a helicopter drop, something along those lines. However, those of you that live under a canopy of trees are actually, you're protected from some wind. You have more shading. You have um, cooler, moister areas. These are, this is actually a good place to be. However, the litter will burn. All right, and if you've got ladder fuels that'll drive the fire, let it cre creep up into the canopy, then you've got a different kind of fire that is a really big problem. Crown fires, torching, things like that where trees are torching. Once you get fire up high, we'll get there, but embers can start moving. Around here, this isn't a lot of embers. This is fire. This is kind of a green picture, so it's hard to really see it, but there's going to be more like that oak litter type stuff. So this is the kind of thing. This is actually good. Limb everything up, get rid of the dead material. Um, that somebody might wish they could understory burn this. This is what fire would look like under there. See how low it is, and it's not, it's not going to move very fast. It will burn. takes its time. You can um, change that. You know, the worse the weather is, the more wind there is, the better the air circulation. Those kinds of things can change that fire behavior. Get out into the sun, because the sun is actually heating, the, heating it up too, bringing it closer to being on fire. So out in the sun is different than being in the shade. This is that kind of slash type of ecosystem I was talking about. Once this stuff is on fire, heating really hot, really hot, throws embers out, stays on fire for a really long time, and um, puts out lots of BTUs. Now if you add slope, right, or if you add wind, now we're starting it to move. We're starting to let it move faster. This is how you watch these kinds of fires where you see big timber fires going because there's a lot of stuff on the ground. It's all getting up into the trees. So you always heard about embers, so I don't have to do this slide, but again, embers is one of our big problems when we think in terms of our community safety. It's firefighter safety. Okay, so here's the basic things. You have to have a source. It needs to get away from where it started, and it needs to land somewhere. It will light something else on fire. So this is how it does it. First of all, you have to have a good source of firebrands. Okay. Susan, did you say eucalyptus? Okay, so these are good. These are the kinds of things where you and I could probably hold our bit to it for a while, kind of like the sages, right? Kind of this idea. This could hold fire. It'll certainly fly easily, right? And when it gets where it's going, it probably will still be on fire because of the oils. And so once it lands, it's looking for, looking for short stuff like this, pretend like this is short. It's looking to land here. Because if it lands here, this will light, right? You have cigarette might light this, right? That's the kind of idea. But you know, if it looked more like, now don't be fooled, I'm going to change this in a second. If it landed on something really green, hmm, got to drive away all that moisture, probably not going to light. However, this is actually what's cedar and, and junipers, you know, these guys, chemical content, bad landscaping idea. Bad landscaping idea. It's really one of those ones. You know, it's the ones where I want to go into LA City and go, look, I'll pay you guys to take all that stuff out. Here, here's bark platelets. Not those. Those will travel, right? They don't stay on fire very long. They can't go too far. Everybody's favorite, loves to be on fire, flies well, very aerodynamic, and where and you know if it has a decent amount of fire in it, it'll last quite a while. On a roof, bad, I, you know that would be really bad. So if you've got you know litter, if you have stuff like this on your roof or in your gutters, and something little like this comes by and lands here, it's going to have plenty of time to light this on fire, and it'll light all of it on fire, and then it'll get established, and that's a bad story. So for, first of all, um, lots of fire brands, and then you can see that uh, the second one over here is, you need a con convection, is hot air, hot air rising. So I mean, that's like the basis of wildland fire right there, hot air rises. Like it's the weather, it's what fire is doing, it's what the heat is doing. 
All right, so here you've got it going places, and here it has to, like I said, remember, it's got to land somewhere. It cannot land on green fuels with just a little ember. It could go against your house, hit it, and land on the ground and not light it on fire. But if you have stuff on the ground next to your house that's light, then that gets going, or the gutter gets going, or the little weird spaces on your roof get going. So here is my example of a um, spot fire all the way across the river. Okay, so this is not a very big fire, and that's a spot fire all the way on the other side of the river. So that's the thing about freeways and dozer lines and fuel breaks and things like that. We have wind-driven fires. Our fires are gonna travel across those barriers. You know, So there you go. Barriers are not really working all the time. Timing is everything with those and how much you can support it. So we worry about spot fires because we don't want to get caught off guard because one of our rules is don't get caught in the green. You know, keep the black right beside you. Be in your safe area. So this was that picture that Robert was talking about for um, that spot fire's gone across the 118. Those guys are doing their best to try to get on top of that. Here's a spot fire into the house. The vegetation's not on fire. I think this is over at Station 70 during the old Topanga fire. So embers is what it comes down to, embers. There's little tiny embers that are gonna just rain shower everywhere that feel like ouch, 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 you know? And then there's the ones that are bigger, like I've been showing you over here. And then, you know, a house itself, for instance, has all kinds of heavy materials that would, would hold fire and get up into that convection and go land on the neighbor's roof or go land somewhere else. So the thing about houses on fire is they're on fire hot for a really long time. Not, I mean, our vegetation goes, <gasps> You know what I mean? It's just there for, it's a short, it's not on fire for very long. Even trees aren't on fire for that long because it does all the light stuff. The tree, you know, the, the, it kind of leaves the, it's like the big stick kind of standing there in the, in the end. But you've seen our fires where there's still stalks, you know, black stalks like that. So really it goes after the available fuels. So houses on fire are a big, big, big problem as for other houses. Matter of fact, I know, I mean, I'm not a structure firefighter, but one of the things they're trying to do is protect the other houses from the house that's on fire. So we have fires that are plume dominated, but that means that it's making its own weather. So it's finally gotten so big that it's this giant sort of thunderstorm overhead. And so it's sucking in its own wind, it's drying out its own fuels, it's sending out spot fires, it's growing and growing and growing and growing. So that's a drag, and that's plume-dominated fire. The station fire, which was during the hot, hot summer, and it was 100 some degrees, and the, I mean, you couldn't even blink, there was no humidity. It was really driven by the topography and fuels, and so it was a plume-dominated fire, and it went on and on, because you can't put out a plume-dominated fire. You wait for the weather to change. That's one of our circuits, okay, we actually don't put fires out till the weather changes. When the wind subsides, you know, on the big fires, that's how it really goes. So if it's gonna be the same weather for a really long time, we're in for the long haul. If it's about to change, then life is good. This is probably the Canyon Fire, and you can see that's a wind-driven fire. See, we know which direction that fire's going. We know right where that's going. We also know that at some point, it's going to stop going that direction and change, because Santa Ana will break down, right? Hopefully I have, I have this one. I took this while during the Corral Fire. Down at Solstice, you know where Solstice is? I took this while I was down there. So this is that column, that plume dump column, breaking down and collapsing, all right? Which is a really interesting shot. Uh, so anybody that fights fire would go, oh, that's cool. All right, and then this is Solstice right before we lost our two houses. Oh, we had lost two buildings there. You can still see one of them. That's the TWR. TRW, that's the TRW building right there. See how it's starting to spin like a whirl? All right, it's just getting up more and more energy and it's at the beach now. And notice it's on the top, it's up in that winds and it's running across the top of everything. So, cause I'm standing down here taking the picture and I'm safe, but this is coming slowly down this hill. There's the other building, that's when the other one went. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So at any rate, so that, I just wanted to show you what fire behavior is like during the, and that, the interesting thing about solstice is it's at the beach. So it's right where all this hot air started coming and it met the morning beach, which was still a little bit cooler. So it set up this like, oh, I'm gonna fight and we're gonna spin, we're gonna spin this, we'll spin the weather, we're gonna spin the column right there. 
And so we already talked about Santa Ana winds. So remember I said fuels, weather, and topography. So I showed you some topography, and I showed you the fuels, and then I'm not going to talk about weather because you already know all about that. And you know the results. But fire danger, I'll go through this pretty quick. So we got these signs at our fire stations now, right, that s tell us what fire danger is. And a lot of people are like, and that means to me what? Well, to me, as a firefighter, I got somebody who taught me that, and I know what it means to me. But fire danger has input of how long since rain. It wants to know about the fuel moisture. It wants to know the temperature, relative hu humidity, and wind speed. And it's a big math formula. And we come up, in our case, we use burning index. There's also something called ERC. But we use burning name deaths because wind is part of it and because our fires are driven by wind. We learn how fast it will spread, how much energy it's going to release, how hot it is, and what, how big the flame lengths are going to be and how the intensity of the fire in general. So a high, for instance, the BI is somewhere between 75 and 125. So what it's saying to us is, ooh, that's bad, right? That's bad, flame length. Well, you could divide by 10. That's how the flame lengths are supposed to be. So those are between 8 and 12 foot flame lengths. Remember, well, I haven't said this yet, but four foot flame lengths is all the closer you're going to st stand next to a fire. So we have a website, National Park Service. You can read these things there. But on the side on, that's closest to me, this is how fire behaves during those different levels, those fire danger levels. So in here, fuels aren't burning. It's green. And they don't spread rapidly. And we catch these and put these out with a bucket, right? But down here at high, which was that other one, these all the fine fuel de are dead, easily ignite. Um, unintended brush and campfires are likely to escape. Fire spreads rapidly at short distance. Spotting is common. High intensity burning may develop on slopes and in concentrations of fine fuels. So that's a description of fire. Meanwhile, we created this other thing, which is kind of an, what we call an activity level. It was used for timber operations, but I'm thinking about our activity. What should we do or not do those days? So under high, we just say, you know, after 1 p.m., because we might have had a little cooler morning, but after 1 o'clock, it's hot, it's dry, it's probably windy. So any spark causing equi equipment, not a good idea anywhere near any vegetation. Metal blade weed whacking, not a good idea. Might get the string out, but don't use the metal blades. Matter of fact, once you hit June, let's just put the metal bl blades away and let's just go to string. Welding, cutting tools, you know, you might be out there welding something or cutting something, piece of metal. So those sparks are going to go straight into the grasses and how many fires have we been on that have caused by people just sort of doing their thing, but they're not recognizing that those sparks are going to go straight into that dry grass and then straight up that hill. So that's what we saw when we talked about fire danger for people. So when you see the smoky bear signs and you see the different colors, you know, once you get into high, that's, imp that's impressive. And we need to think that in the afternoons, things are actually quite sensitive. And we should change our behavior. And this is all part of fire prevention. So the BIs would have been, like I said, what did I say, 75 to 175 to 125. So down in here, here's your BI, here's the flame length between eight and nine feet, here's the BTUs, and then down here it just says the heat load on people within 30 feet of, the, of a fire is dangerous. Above this intensity, spotting, fire whirls, and crowning. Spotting, fire whirls, and crowning are all examples of extreme fire that, you know, you just sort of, sort of wait for that to subside before you go, in, go after it. So very quickly, here's that four foot thing. This is the math that shows that here's a person doing working, and here's a dozer working, and here's a tree on fire, and here's a whole mountain of trees on fire. What they do is they combine the rate of spread, and they combine the heat per unit area, which is that BTUs that I was talking about. And then they've got fire line intensity, and they have flame lengths. And so at the four foot flame length level, right here, this is where people can actually sit next to fire, one foot in the black, and scratch line or squirt water. After, when it gets any higher than that, then we're talking about dozers can do the work. If you, a dozer, dozer can even go there, and if you want one, and I'm in a parking, and I don't want one. And then here's trees on fire. So that's, that's what fire behavior does when we're thinking about firefighting. So here's a couple examples. These guys are just going to scratch you know, a black line right along here, and this fire is going to come toward them. They've got on all these clothes that protects them from any heat, and they should be able to stay direct. The trick to this is, is that the fuels change pretty quickly and that these flames could change easily on them. They need to be able to get into the black. Here's about four foot flame lengths. And then this is an augmentation. When you have something like water or a helicopter drop or something like that, you've taken the four foot flame, you know, maybe a 20 foot flame length and you brought it to four feet. That's the idea. So we kind of work in concert with this equipment. And so there's an example of that dozer is probably very unhappy right now.
because that's not what he wanted to do. He wanted to kind of stay under that, so he's probably going, oh. And as you can see, a helicopter would be used on this, and that's just a great shot. So safety zones, we talk about life. You know, we talk about defensible space in terms of our house surviving, so it's gonna survive if we give it 100 feet of radiant heat protection. Um, people, though, not necessarily, because what happens is if the air is too hot and we breathe superheated air, it melts our lungs. Not even my skin isn't burnt, you know what I'm saying? So there's a lot more, you know, I'm not really worried about being burned as much as, as sucking up some superheated air. So in order not to do that, you kind of, this is the formula, four times the flame height. So we know that our brush is already get peaking around 10 to 20 feet, right? So suddenly, in order to be safe from, and this is flat ground, you need four times that distance of no fuel. So there's not a lot of safety zones here, okay? There's just not. And it's hard to create a safety zone at your home with enough defensible space that firefighters can stand there. I mean, they've got on clothes, and they have breathing apparatuses, but wildland fighters don't come with breathing apparatuses. That's sort of a structure thing. It's, you can't fight fire with a breathing apparatus. It's heavy, it only lasts so long, you can hardly see. It's hard enough in a building. Outside, it's crazy. So it's not really the place for that kind of equipment. So we're out there and we don't have a breathing apparatus and you don't have even what we have. So there aren't a lot of safety zones around here. Um, so <coughs> what carries fire where you live? Is it grass, brush, is it timber litter, or is it slash? What is going on at your house? This is Ron Durbin's picture, and he's always saying, you know, you need this to be 10 feet away from your house, and there shouldn't be stuff on your fences and stuff like this. But I took those little words out because, honest to Pete, do those people know, not know what's going on? So this picture, hopefully you've all seen this or many like it, the home ignition zone, Jack Cohen study about how do you make your house safe? You work from your house out and you go out a certain number of feet and you change the dynamics around your house so you can change the fire behavior. You want that fire to be down on the ground and low and not moving very fast and you don't want all that stuff to be anywhere near this to, because you don't want this to be something like this, right? So this is on fire, so now these are on fire, so now your house is on fire. That's basically what it amounts to, is we don't want that setup. So what would you take away? Well, we're the first one, that's easy. I only had to do what I didn't have to do much to do that, right? So that's the kind of thought process I hope to leave you with. How do you start changing fire behavior? Create, okay, I'm coining new words here. I called it an ashtray that didn't seem very Suitable, so an ember tray. So around your house for three to five feet should be no vegetation. Put rocks there, put sidewalks there, put dirt there, do something. That shouldn't burn, because stuff is gonna come off of your house too on fire. Like what if you have something in your gutter and the gutter's on fire and then the gutter melts and it's on the ground, so don't. And then, so start with the broom, right? The broom is the first most important thing. These guys are highly flammable. And they are, th and they are, they're out to get your house. If they're on fire, get out of there. Clean your roof and well, first clean the roof and gutters first, and then sweep because otherwise. So keep that ember. <laughs> Just let me be practical. <laughs> you have to sweep twice. <laughs> So anyway, I call it an ember tray, it's like an ashtray. So when all those embers are coming at your house, they hit it and they drop down into an ashtray and they don't burn anything, not your plants, not your house, nothing. So that's what's going on right there. So next, get out the rake. Okay, Marty, are you happy? Oh, good. <laughs> rake away the loosely, you know, rake away. You know, you can rake away this. Now, I'm not suggesting all pine needles and all oak leaves have to be raked away. Remember, they are compact. They could be wet, not too thick. But most pine needles, mm, those are a problem in my gutter for sure. And they have an oil to them, so they might be on fire. So you have to weigh that out. That first five foot area, keep that clean. Then you got that next, you know, 20 or 30 feet to start managing it. So get out the rake, get rid of those loosely compacted fields. Next, I want you to get out your clippers. You know, I, I never go outside in my backyard without these. 
because this is what I seem to do the most in my backyard. These will get you a long way. You want the little dead stuff all gone. This is the size you need for a while. Start at the beginning of your house and get all the dead stuff out and think about those ladder fuels and maybe give everybody a little base away from the ground, stuff like that. So get out your pruners. Then get out your bigger pruners. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay, so that one, so that branch is a little bigger. Look. So the little pruners aren't working, then get out those, all right? Keep your shrubs apart, right? A couple of them together. You gotta remember patchy fuels and continuous fuels. You gotta make your fuels patchy too. You may use some rocks near them, so you gotta keep them apart. Don't get them too, but you can have a few together, but you need, you need to have enough space so that if they're on fire, that they don't light something next to them on fire. So you're trying to change the fire behavior. So change the vertical, right? All the ladder fuels and the horizontal con continuity at your house. So um, don't let vegetation touch fences. Don't let it touch, don't let your fence touch your house. That's another conduit of taking fire to your house, right? A wood house, wood fence, wood fence on fire, wood house on fire. So that's a, that's break that up, all right? Trees, structures, keep the vegetation down, away, pruned, green, whatever it takes. Then we get to get out the chainsaw, and we can start thinning things. You can start taking out dead wood. You can take out large fuels. Um, you can get the chipper program type stuff works at this point where you start bringing some vegetation out of your house. Get those trees, get, you should be able to walk under your trees or at least there's no vegetation under your trees, no bushes growing up to send fire up into your trees. Remember, it's kind of a little ladder work. You need to work with that. So this, at the park, we have this spot that has this beautiful garden that everybody adores and I have since made many. Not enemies, <laughs> exactly, because the Park Service people are very nice and they wouldn't make me an enemy. However, they have this wonderful garden that they put right beside the building that's full of these native plants, you know, and I'm like, that's just really dumb. So, as you can see, I convinced them to change some things here, all right, and so work from your house out. Start with the broom, get out the rake, move to your clippers, then your pruners, then your mower. Got the weed whacker, the trimmer, the hedger, and then the chainsaw. Chip chippers, dumpsters, things like that. And then you can get, you know, that, but work from your home outward. Don't work from outward to your home, because if you make a donut on the outside and you still got all that vegetation inside, it's like, oh, I'll just land here. I'm an ember. This looks good. That was a very good way out here, but hey, look at this house. I think I'll just land next to it. So that's kind of why we keep saying house out, you know, ember trays and house out. Always, what was that, home ignition zone? What was our fire adapted community? Is that it? I love that. That's really great because here that will work. Fuel breaks, prescribed fires, those aren't working. It's just not working. Putting firefighters in front of your house to put the fire out, not working. You know, your house needs to be bulletproof. It needs to, you need to be able to ready, set, and go. And you're like, my house is going to make it. Say that again? I'm just pushing the drill. Oh yeah, yeah. And there's, of course there's the drill. And you guys are really proactive. You make an awesome audience because you're, you listen and you take this home and you do this kind of stuff. And you're the ones that have asked us this question the most. What should we be doing at our house? So here's another picture before of that place and after. So this is kind of what you're trying to do too. And I know we want our privacy screens and we love our vegetation, but are we gonna live here or not? So beautiful manzanita. More questions? Can I answer? I'm sorry it's so late. Good, smart. I must have just told you everything you needed to know. <laughs> right on. Well, you know what? Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you and being such a great audience.